Okay, symptoms of stress incontinence. So urinary linkage with uh, physical activity of some kind, exercise, coughing, sneezing, lifting, standing up from seated position. No linkage at night, usually nocturia, don't wear pads at night. Uh, so the goal of therapy is to improve that uh, urethral uh, closure or sphincter uh, support, 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 supportive structures. Um, so here, we're, we don't use the, these antispasmodics, as, as you all call them, or anti-muscarinics. Uh, so here, for if you're dealing with women who are uh, postmenopausal, even if they're young, uh, often it will be due to estrogen decrease in estrogen activity. Uh, they may have other symptoms of like vaginal um, atrophy. Uh, so often, giving them or restoring estrogen will restore that epithelium, and their symptoms will go down. Um, so we can use a we usually use topical estrogen. So we'll use intravaginal. It, uh, it stays local usually, you don't get much absorption, so you don't get a lot of systemic estrogen effects. Uh, there are two major products on the market, Primarin and Estrace. I think more people prefer Estrace now because it's a beta estradiol uh, formulation, very less, not very likely to be uh, absorbed. Uh, so this, that is a, uh, that is very uh, good to consider in women who are um, perimenopausal, they're going through, or they're uh, just premenopausal, say they're late 40s, early 50s, or they're postmenopausal. There are other products, the, the, all of these are estrogen. So Vagifem is a tablet that can be inserted if women don't want to mess with uh, uh, creams or, and feel like they're messy. Uh, there's also a ring called Estring. Uh, that can be put in place, held intravaginally for 90 days. Uh, so there's lots of different ways to deliver. The only problem with these is that they are slow. So it can take a couple of weeks or longer uh, to get effect. Uh, so you have to, it, it takes time for that, uh, that uh, the vagina to re-epithelialize. That's what the, the estrogens will do. So sometimes, so sometimes it will take some time. So sometimes it's better to use the creams early on, and then once they're stabilized, you can convert them over to the estrogen. Starting with estrogen is probably not the best place because it, it doesn't. It just the amount of estrogen that leaks out is very low. Um, and this, the the um, the doses that are there are more for maintenance. So if we were treating somebody acute for acute symptoms, we would put them on daily. Vagifem or uh, vag vaginal estrogen uh, for a couple of weeks, then we would start to decrease and taper them down to once or twice uh, a week, either with the tablet or the cream or convert them over to the ring. Now this is three months for them to notice benefit. They'll notice benefit all along. Your, your major benefit or your maximum benefit will be at that three months. If they don't want to deal with estrogens, or they have a contraindication to the use of estrogen, then you could look at duloxetine, which is a uh, antidepressant. Uh, but it is a mixed; it's a SNRI and a um, so it does uh, serotonin and norepinephrine. We use it for a lot of uh, different things other than depression. We, you'll see them in peripheral neuropathy as well. Uh, so it is a, another drug that could be considered. If women can't use estrogens. Um, again, modest uh, effects, so small decreases in episode frequency and trips to the, the, uh, the toilet. Side effects, it's usually pretty well uh, tolerated. Uh, less dry mouth. Uh, insomnia, we just deal with that by the way we uh, space it throughout the day, once or twice a day. You do have to taper it. I see I've got a typo. So if you have to stop the drug, taper the dose to avoid uh, withdrawal symptoms. Questions about those? If you have a mixed incontinence, you're going to treat just symptoms. Whatever the major complaint is, that's what you'll target. Okay, and then I put in a, a thing about urinary incontinence supply. Since most of you are very young, uh, you may not have come across these before or not know what is available. 
So I thought I'd walk through some of these. That's what those last two objectives are looking at. So there's all types of products. Again, if you watch TV and watch commercials, uh, these are on the TV all the time. Uh, so you've got pads, you've got garments, uh, you know, you've got, now they look more like underwear. Uh, this is the baby boomers wanting their, you know, their youth to continue and things not to change too much. Uh, you've got uh, also uh, pads that you can use for people who are more um, at bed rest or not going to be moving around a lot. So the pads that are out there, um, there's pads for men and pads for women. They need to be formulated for incontinence. Uh, the ones that are, that are um, designed for women who are menstruating or don't have a big enough capacity. So the one thing also to consider with these products and which ones you choose depends on lifestyle, what the person's doing, but the other is the capacity of the product. So the pads will have the least. Uh, the most are going to be the, I'll show you, with some of the undergarments have greater capacity. They also are designed for men or for women. Um, based on where the urine's going, they'll most likely land. Just like with you, in diapers, you got female diapers and male diapers, so it's the same thing. These are very absorbent. They are also designed to keep odor down. They're also designed to wick the, the uh, urine away from the skin. So one of the main problems is, just like with a baby, if you do not check that diaper often enough and you get urine coming into contact with skin, it breaks the skin down. So that can be a problem in the elderly because they may not complain or someone may not be caring for them, or their self-care or other care is not very attentive. Uh, so that's one of the things to keep in mind as you're looking at uh, the different products. Okay. So this is one for female. Uh, they have all different kinds of uh, uh, capacities, so you'll, uh, and sizes. So they come in regular lengths, they come in very long lengths uh, to cover more of the perineum. Um, it shows you here it's got um, it's got a uh, uh, it wicks it away like like diapers do it uh, it has the uh, ela ela um, elastic uh, sides to keep urine from leaking uh, and keeping uh, the person dry so for someone who uh, like overnight or uh, that has small amounts of leaks then this is probably a good product if you look down um, the capacity of disposable products. So you're looking at about uh, 10 to 12 ounces. Here's the guards for men. So very similar, but more of the, the uh, material is up front. Uh, some of these will also have um, uh, wet um, uh, indicators uh, or uh, uh, capacity indicators. So it'll tell you if the person has uh, is reaching the capacity of the product as well. So that's for men. Here's a disposable brief. These now come in all kinds of colors uh, and, and sizes and shapes. And they've gotten thin enough and their capacity is high enough that people can wear them under clothes. So these are becoming more popular, uh, especially at night. Uh, they can be good ones uh, as well. So undergarments have a capacity of 12 to 18 ounces. So people have um, problems at night may prefer those. When looking at briefs, uh, look at what the, the uh, demand of the person is or on the care provider. Uh, so looking for how easy is it to get them on. So if somebody is not able to cooperate with you very much or they have some dementia or they're more at rest and they don't have a lot of muscle strength, then trying to pull up a brief is going to be difficult. These are uh, nice because they've got Velcro sides on either way. So they're much easier. Well, this one's not Velcro, it's a tape. So it's much easier for somebody to help someone into it or to change someone. And this one has a uh, urine indicator, a wetness indicator uh, at the bottom. This one, if you, this one just requires a little bit more looking at it, but it, it shows you all the different things you're going to want to be looking at um, in terms of 
liners, how do you fasten it, the leg elastic, um, the wetness indicator. It just gives you a little bit more of all the different um, factors that are, or characteristics of these products. There's also a reusable um, undergarment, so you can insert a pad into them uh, if they don't want to wear the, the, uh, the briefs. Uh, or, and they get expensive. Those briefs can be very expensive. So this one has a shield that can be put into the crotch. So a different, different approach. Uh, you can also use uh, elastic um, coverings like we do sometimes with babies. Uh, the, the problem there, the only problem I see is that I think they are more prone to skin breakdown uh, because they really hold the flute of the urine in if somebody isn't changing or paying attention. But if you've got somebody who's leaking and you are trying to protect uh, furniture uh, or bedding, uh, then uh, using that may be helpful if, if you've got somebody who's fairly attentive to that person's needs. The other would be uh, under pads. Um, so you may even see these in your practice. Uh, we had to use it in our practice because in diabetes we had a lot of people who are incontinent. Uh, so protecting your, uh, your furniture, bedding. You can get waterproof uh, coverings for mattresses as well. So kind of having an idea of or being conversant with them I think will make older people feel more comfortable with you and discussing it because at least you're aware of the different things that are out there and, and aware of the, of the problems that are associated with caring some, somebody who's in trouble. Questions or comments about this? Okay. Let's switch over to urinary tract infections. <laughs> spend most of the time there and then we'll talk about complicated UTIs uh, at the end and that would include pyloprides. We talked about, you had a clinic over this. Okay, so what did you learn? What was your takeaway on UTIs? Yes? No? Yeah, we haven't had it yesterday. Sorry, we did it. We talked about a lot yesterday. Okay. Or Tuesday, sorry. Okay. Okay. So a cystitis is we're talking about a bladder infection. Pyelonephritis, you're talking about above the bladder. So most of the time, you're going to, what you're going to see, common, common, especially if you're dealing with a lot of women, is you're going to see a lot of uncomplicated uh, UTIs. Let's go down to epidemiology. So sexually active women, there, it's a high percentage. Uh, if you look at incidents, it's 0.5 to 0.7 UTIs per, per person year. That means most women will, in their lifetime, uh, probably have an episode of a urinary tract infection. Risk factors are sexual intercourse, using spermicides, so using spermicides as a contraceptive product or using products that use spermicides like uh, condoms or a diaphragm. <coughs> Diaphragms in and of themselves, because of the way they sit up in the vaginal vault, can put pressure on the bladder and cause uh, urinary uh, or UTIs just because of their mechanical nature. Uh, they also are used with spermicides. So the use of those spermicides, they're irritating, increase the risk of, of UTIs. Uh, let's see. Pyelonephritis, much less um, common than, than, you, than a, a cystitis. Uh, college, so in women, the problem is, is that it's the short distance between the, 
anus and the, the, the uh, urethra. So you get colonization with those um, intestinal bugs, and so they tend to be the ones that show up and cause the problem. Okay, next page. Etiology. This is the important one. So we're back to that same kind of thought process we've had every time I've talked to you about an infection disease, infection disease uh, topic. So for the most part, it's E. coli. Major gut bacteria, most of the time that's what you're going to see. Uh, Enterobacter ratio can be, so Proteus and Klebsiella would be common. Staph saprophyticus is the other one. So actually E. coli and Staph saprophyticus are probably the most common ones you'll see in people who don't have under, other underlying problems or disorders. Asymptomatic bacteri bacteria, another common uh, problem you'll see in young women. Again, E. coli tends to be the major one. And in pyelonephritis, it's E. coli. So it's E. coli almost every time. Isolation of organisms from avoided streams. You talk about the difficulty. So in men, it's not so hard to get a clean catch, midstream catch. But in women, it's hard because we tend to it, we contaminate it a lot. So let me give you some guidelines. So there's a high concordance rate. If you get E. coli, even if there's a low number of colony forming units in a woman's urine, it has a high concordance with them growing it out as a, as a pathogen. On the other hand, if you're seeing lactobacilli, enterococcus, or group B strep, it's more than likely contaminant. Low concordance with seeing it on the in the catch in the, in the urine and it growing out an organism that is is causing an infection. Does that make sense? So if you see E. coli, it's probably an infection. Resistance. This is big. Again, here we come again with resistance. So if they've recently used a broad spectrum antibiotic. Here we're going to worry more about trimsulfa and the fluoroquinolones. If they've had healthcare exposure, so if they're coming to you out of the nursing home, out of an extended care facility, uh, out of a, a hospitalization, then they're going to be more likely colonized with bugs that are multiple drug resistant. Right? We've seen that before. MDRs. Where do we see that? What does what infections do we talk about? Pseudomonas. Pneumonias. Okay, resistance rates, ampicillin resistance rates. If you were sitting, when I was sitting where you were, ampicillin was a drug we used all the time for UTIs. Can't use it anymore, the resistance. This is the, 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 the fruit of overuse of antibiotics. Don't be in that category. We have killed off all of our easy to use drugs because we've overused them. It's so easy to do. But we have knocked out, and even since I have started teaching this topic here, I have seen uh, drugs like Trimsulfa fall out of uh, systemic use because the, the rates of, of resistance are, are growing. Trimsulfa, uh, if, it, if the resistance rate is 20% or above, we know that it will be ineffective. Uh, so if you know in your area, uh, whether or not you use it with sulfamethoxazole doesn't matter. First and second generation oral cephalosporins have maintained a pretty good effect. They tend to concentrate in the urine. We, we filter them, put them in the urine, there, and they can have effect in the bladder. Uh, moxicillin clavulanate still holds pretty good effect. It's just not first line. Fluoroquinolones. The resistance rates are rising. Over the last decade, they have like tripled. So the problem is, is that people like to use them because they, if you, if you give it to somebody, it's pretty much going to cure anything, but the collateral damage is high. So you end up uh, fostering the development of drug resistant bugs. Okay? So it's no longer recommended that fluoroquinolones be used first line for UTIs. They, we need to reserve them for complicated UTIs or other diseases where we don't have good antibiotic coverage. 
Nitrofurantoin and phosphomycin, very low resistance, they're, they're in that first line of, of drugs. So if you have somebody come in, they've got it, and that you're pretty sure it's a cystitis, if they have used sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim in the last three to six months, or they've done international travel, don't use the drug. Other resistant organisms. So E. coli, which has usually been sensitive to about everything we have used, is increasing in resistance. I've read more and more about these extended spectrum beta lactamase producing strains. So they're referred to in the literature as ESBL strains. They are very fluoroquinolone resistant. They're resistant to a lot of the things we use, uh, usually. Uh, so kind of keep that in mind, that designation. Um, they are a growing problem and they are a growing cause of UTIs. I'm not going to spend any time on, on PEDS because we're, we'll talk about it when we get to the pediatric module. Um, and the elderly, I'm going to say a little bit about uh, later on in, uh, in the handout. So clinical manifestations, you've talked about those. You know what the common of a cystitis are. So dysuria, frequency, uh, urgency, suprapubic pain, hematuria, common. Localized bladder infection. If they have systemic or constitutional symptoms, and that that's worse. That's then we're more worried. If they've got fever and other symptoms, then we're going to be uh, more worried. So, uh, symptoms of cystitis can be subtle, meaning they may have very low grade or very uh, few symptoms, but they have significant infection. Elderly are very common in this category, especially your nursing home patients, even your community uh, living uh, patients can be. Pyelonephritis usually have those symptoms as well as fever, chills, flank pain, worse flank pain. Between your ribs, top of your hip, right? Uh, or CBA uh, tenderness, where's that? What rib is it? Twelve, and the other part of the angle is the vertebral, and why is it significant? Where the kidneys are. Okay, nausea and vomiting. Very good. Okay. Um, so you talked about it, your analysis. So what are you going to do? Somebody comes in with cystitis. What do you get? What do you order? So you do a dipstick. What are you looking for? Leukocytes. Okay. Okay, good. Um, ask about potential pregnancy in females because that may change the drugs that you choose. So goals of treatment. We're going to get rid of the organism. We want to keep the complications away. We want to decrease the potential for collateral damage. We're only worried about bladder infection, okay? So we don't want to give a drug that's going to hit every part of the body, all right? So collateral damage is just like they use it in war. It's taking out things that weren't our target. So we want to use drugs that have very little collateral damage. Fluoroquinolones, high collateral damage. Nitrofurantine, very low because it just secretes into the bladder. That's it. It doesn't get absorbed. doesn't affect the rest of the body, usually. So there's non-pharmacologic measures and adjuncts that we can use. These are a lot of them are over the counter. Patients can get a hold of them. They self-treat until it doesn't go away and then they come see you. So one of the common ones is finazopyridine. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Perineum. Yes. So a urinary analgesic, it can be used. Uh, so the antibiotics may have a lag a day or two before you get full resolution of symptoms. This will help them feel better. Um, it comes over the counter, so they can buy about a lower strength over the counter or a higher strength you can give them a prescription for. Uh, the big thing with it is that it will turn their urine red. If they don't know that, please tell them because it could scare them. And it will stain their clothing. It is an orange, red, very brilliant, like that. Uh, cranberry juice, a common. Uh, out there that people uh, know about. 
Uh, it does have some effects on decreasing uh, bacterial adherence to the bladder cells. Um, the problem with that I have with cranberry juice is that cranberry juice is not cranberry juice is not cranberry juice. So you can buy 100%, you can get 10%, and it's all called juice. Um, so amount, but the amount of sugar in them is high, which then aggravates vaginitis and urinary tract. So I, I don't know that I think this one's a great one, but uh, it has shown an absolute risk reduction of 12 to 20 percent in terms of prevention. So uh, it may be a value for some. Uh, topical estrogens, we just talked about it for urinary incontinence. For women who are postmenopausal or menopausal, then estrogens can decrease the symptoms of um, uh, vaginal atrophy. They often will complain of the same things. They'll complain of frequent urination, pain on urination. You do a, a, a you get a urine specimen. There's nothing there. Uh, so often treating them with a topical uh, estrogen will decrease those symptoms, but will also be preventative in terms of them being susceptible to, um, to uh, cystitis. Next page, probiotics. They raise their head again. It's an infection, so a probiotic must work. So these are over-the-counter, so lactobacilli um, has been recommended uh, to decrease the risk in, in terms of preve uh, prevention. It is not a proven. Uh, probably ain't gonna hurt them, probably won't, but it may not help. Uh, it's thought to block the ability of those pathogens from adhering to the bladder wall. That's what that steric uh, hindrance is. Okay, so those are all the adjunctive treatments. So let's look at the antibiotics. So there are, in terms of antibiotics, the major thing is E. coli and Staph saprophyticus. That's what we're, we're after. So one of the things to look at first is to question the person and figure out if you're dealing, dealing with a possibility of a multi-drug resistant bug. So the thing, there's three things. It's the healthcare facility, we talk about that. Um, they have used one of the agents that we want to use in the last few months, and they travel to parts of the world where resistance is high, and I'm giving you those. India, Israel, Spain, and Mexico. You'll see this pop up again and again when you're looking at for polynephritis or cystitis, these three things all the time. Are you dealing with a multi-drug resistant problem? The first line are the drugs that are listed there, nitrofurantoin, trimethoprim sulfa, and phospholysin. Shorter courses usually work. Usually in the three to six days, it's good because adherence is better, um, and it's comparable to using a drug for seven to 14 days. So for an uncomplicated, non-pregnant female, five days is usually a sufficient treatment, except for trim sulfa you can use for three days. Okay, so let's look at nitrofurantoin on the next page. It's very effective for cystitis. It concentrates very well in the bladder. It has a very low resistance uh, pattern, and it has very low collateral damage. Perfect drug. Only has to be used twice a day for five days. Clinical cure rates, the 80 to 90 percent range. One of the problems is renal impairment. So below 30 mils per minute, it's recommended you not use it. The manufacturer says don't use it in creatinine clearances less than 60. But there's three studies that have looked at this and evaluated the efficacy of the drug in people with creatinine clearances between 30 and 60 and found it to be effective. So the recommendation that is in the guidelines is to use it in, down to a creatinine clearance of 30 mils per minute. Side effects. So most common uh, is that it turns the urine brown. In, the, in this uh, PowerPoint, I've given you a, um, a slide that shows you all the different drugs that turn urine a different color. Anywhere, it's the rainbow, except green. Pink, blue, brown, orange, blue, black, and red. 
Okay, so this turns it brown. Um, usually very well tolerated, but it can cause hemolytic anemia in the G6PD, so keep that in mind for that, that uh, group. It does have one unusual and rare side effect, and that is uh, pulmonary fibrosis. There's an acute and a chronic form. Acute starts fairly soon after they have uh, taken a course of the drug. So if, if you've got a young woman complaining of sudden onset, shortness of breath, uh, irritating cough, a rash maybe, chest pain, cyanosis, that is, it. this drug can do that. And it can do a chronic one. It can do, it can set up a chronic. So if you use this drug to prophylax, so let's say you've got somebody who's having recurrent UTIs and you put them on a low dose of nitrofurantoin daily then they can develop a chronic form of this, which can develop months to years after they have either been on it or taken that. So keep that in mind. It should be an unusual presentation because most of the time these are younger women who are going to be on it. If you recognize it and pull them off, it's usually a good prognosis. They'll usually recover. Okay, page, um, my pages are off for you. Go over to trim sulfate. Page nine for me. What is it? Eight. Eight. Excellent drug, but we have overused it. We used to be able to use it for anything systemic, anything local, but the resistance rates have gotten have climbed. So this is still a good drug if you um, if you have a culture and sensitivity and you know the drug is is uh, susceptible, use it. It's a three day uh, treatment, so it's a it's a very good, very effective drug. Very high. Uh, rates of 80, 85 to 100 percent. The biggest thing is resistance. So if they've had it in the last three months, don't use it. Uh, fairly well for, for a three-day course, very few people have trouble with it. Uh, the only thing would be is don't use it close to the time of delivery uh, because it can cause conicterus uh, in the newborn or high delivery levels. Next page, phosphomycin. So this is an unusual drug. It's like no other antibiotic you've talked about. It's pretty much, as far as I know, this is its only indication. Uh, it has lots of advantages because it can be used, it's a one-time dose. You could give it in the office. It's a powder, you mix it with water, they drink it, three gram, done. The problem is, so this is all, has been considered one of the first line drugs. The, but there's been a recent open label study that came out and showed that compared to nitrofurantoin, it was, had a lower efficacy. You're doing that one? Yeah. Okay, is it the open label one? So the problem that some people are pointing to, or maybe I shouldn't tell you, this is probably part of it. Do it, do it. <laughs> well, what is an open label design? Well, you got to know that or you can't uh, evaluate the study. When do you have to do this? Have you all talked about open label designs? No. Well, open label means that everybody knows what they're getting. So, you, so it's not blinded. Okay. So there's, some, there's bias in, always in open label. But there's a significant reduction in, in, and you have to look at the endpoints. How did they measure the endpoints? Because if it's something that's objective that the patient can't modify, then the study, the results are more valid. Uh, but this has led to some people backing off of this drug as a first line and considering it as a close second line if you can't use some uh, trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, or nitrofurantoin. Okay. I love it. One time, done. Okay, so keep that one in mind. All right. Well, that's interesting you're going to do that. And that's why he came and asked me about phosphomycin. <laughs> Renetta popped in my office and said, what do you know about phosphomycin? Well, you're going to know. <laughs> and I said, why? And he said, well, we're going to compare it to <coughs> no other Okay. <laughs> well, I think it's just an article. It's this article. It's from Yama. Yeah. It's out of Jama. She said it's a good label, but that one is... 
the analyst is going to do it. Uh, all right, page 11. So what do you use if you can't use those three? What do you use? Well, you can use the fluoroquinolones, but consider them second or third line uh, because of the uh, overuse. So Cipro and Levo are usually the ones that are used, usually five to seven days. Very good. Uh, the other would be the oral beta-lactam. Unless you know you have one of those, those ESBL E. coli. So, Augmentin, uh, any, of the, any of these cephalosporins. So, you've got first generation cephalosporins listed there, second and third. Um, so, they usually have higher resistance rates. If you have a culture and sensitivity and you know they're effective, there's no problem in using it. It's just that a lot of times people treat these and they don't, have, they don't get a culture and sensitivity, or they treated them for several days before they get the results back. The ring they eliminate, they concentrate the urine, so if, if they're susceptible, they will do the job. Okay, next page. So what do you, when to follow up? Well, if it's an acute simple cystitis, person doesn't have any other underlying problems, they respond well, symptoms go away, you don't have to do a follow up. But if they continue to have persistent symptoms, then you need to bring them back in. Uh, there you may need to do, uh, culture and sensitivity might be hard because you've used an antibiotic. Um, but you may want to work them up for anatomic ab abnormalities, which always complicate the, uh, the response and complicate the picture. Did you all talk about that? Okay, recurrent. So, it is not uncommon. Most women who've got a, a UTI will have UTIs and other UTI. So, are they reinfected or are they relapsing? Is it the same bug that you just didn't get rid of it or is it a reinfection with a different bug? So, sometimes you have to look at, at a timeline, uh, how is it occurring, uh, and then retreat them. Look at, look at um, continuous prophylaxis when you've got either two UTIs uh, or more in a six month or three UTIs or more in 12 months. So here we use a small amount of drug. What's thought is you've got a nidus of, of bacteria that you are not eradicating. So using a one-time dose nightly for six months uh, is, the, is the recommendation. You can use try it. Uh, uh, Bactrim, trimethoprim by itself, nitrofurantoin, or Cipro. There's also an approach called postcoital therapy. If women always have uh, a UTI secondary to sexual intercourse, then having them uh, do a, a postcoital void of the bathroom and then take a dose of antibiotic is another approach. Same antibiotics. Okay, so the uh, next is the symptomatic abacteria. So they've got all the symptoms, but you can never grow out uh, an organism. The recommendation is to go ahead and treat those like a cystitis, same, same antibiotic. Um, so with, if you look at page 13, it gives you some um, guidelines. For women, the recommendation is two consecutive clean catch voided specimens, same organism, with at least 10 colony uh, forming units per milliliter. What's 10 to the fifth? 100,000. 10 times 10 times 10, so it's five zeros and a one. For men, because men, the UTIs are so unusual in men, one clean catch. Well, we don't even worry about clean catch. A single catch um, specimen, again, uh, even in the, with the absence of, of symptoms, but you've got uh, organisms that you're growing, then that is um, that would qualify. So, more common with women, creases with advancing age, correlates with sexual activity. So, all the things we saw before. Young, healthy women, though, be careful. They usually have transient uh, bacteria. It usually doesn't last very long. So uh, being probably a little bit more conservative there. 
Diabetic women tend to have this problem more often. Uh, they tend to have, if, especially, uh, especially if they've had the diabetes for a long period of time and they have more complications. does not seem to be related to uh, the level of glycemic control. Though. For men, it tends to happen in older men. You see 75 and older, uh, but not so much in diabetic men. So who do you treat? Elderly, very common in the elderly, but studies have shown that treatment makes no difference. Doesn't change the outcome, doesn't, doesn't uh, help in terms of symptoms, so the recommendation is not to treat. Let's go down to non-pregnant premenopausal women. No rural role, so we don't screen women, even though that it's common in, in young age groups, we don't screen. Uh, treatment doesn't uh, reduce the frequency. Uh, it doesn't affect long-term adverse outcome or uh, chronic kidney disease or mortality. So who to treat? Higher risk, diabetics, anatomic or neuro, uh, neurologic abnormalities, so like spinal cord injuries would be uh, in that category. Immunocompromised, if they've had a urologic manipulation like men, uh, then it would be treat. And the, the, the drugs are listed there. Similar to what we've already talked about, trimsulfa, the quinolones, nitrofurantine, phosphomycin. Okay. Y'all have a class at three? Yes. Okay, so let me tell you what I've done on, with pyelonephritis. So again, here it's E. coli that we're mostly uh, working with. Clinical presentation is listed on the next page, but what I've done after that is I've, I've organized into four different types of presentations. So this, and I'm looking mostly at outpatient. I'm not, I'm gonna, I've gotten, I have listed for you what you do on inpatient, but what I would test you over would be outpatient. So if you look under empiric antibiotic therapy in an outpatient setting, I don't know what page that is, 15 or 14. So you've got to assess one is, do you, are they at risk for having multi-drug resistant organisms? Are there any contraindications to using fluoroquinolone? Do they have allergy? So if that first section, here these folks, you're always going to do a gram stain and get a culture insensitivity, all three. So fluoroquinolones are drug of choice. If there's no contraindications, you don't think that you're dealing with a high uh, risk of resistant organisms, then you can treat them with oral fluoroquinolones for five to seven days. That's the easiest. This is pilo, mild pilo outpatient. Let's say you're worried about fluoroquinolone resistance. Then what you're going to do is you're going to give them an IV or IM, you're going to give them a parenteral antibiotic plus the fluoroquinolone. So here, ceftriaxone, ertapenem, or an aminoglycoside. One of those, one time, then give them the, the oral antibiotic. Same thing, five to seven days. Okay, next page, third category, top of, the, well, it's top of my page. Here, these are people with risk factors for multi-drug resistance. They've been outside the country, they traveled internationally to a place that has high risk of um, resistance, um, or they've been hospitalized, or they, um, what was the third one, sorry. Here, you're gonna use ertapenem, very powerful drug, one time, and then the PO fluoroquinolones. If they've got the MDR, um, plus contraindications, or you're, you suspect resistance is high, in those folks you put them on ertapenem and you give it to them once a day until your culture and sensitivity come back and then you treat them according to that. Okay? So categorize in those four ways. The one thing I've seen in the last few years is that they really upped the aggressiveness and we've had to go to more high power antibiotics with pilo than we used to. We used to get treated with trimsulf, I can't do that anymore. Or the recommendation, I'm sure people still do it, but uh, the recommendation is not to do that. 
if you look down on the, the very last part of that is inpatient treatment. Again, here what they do is how critically ill is the patient? Are they septic? Um, are you dealing with an obstruction, a urinary tract obstruction? So there, these folks you may be taking and doing studies on to figure that out. If the answer is no, then you use a broad spectrum antibiotic, ceftriaxone, third generation cephalosporin, piperacillin, tazobactam, a fluoroquinolone, and you use a, that big guns until you get your culture and sensitivity back. Then you modify. So you start them on that, those big drugs, you modify, you keep them on IV until they are pretty much asymptomatic and look like they're on the road to recovery, switch them over to uh, oral antibiotic. You keep them on that antibiotic depending on what antibiotic did you choose. It's fluoroquinolone, you may only treat them for five to seven days. Okay. How sick were they? Other compl complications. So they may be on that therapy for as long as two weeks, depending on the antibiotics that you've chosen. Okay? So you have a standard type of antibiotic to choose. Switch them once you know what, what the, uh, they're sensitive to. Keep them on IV until they are recovering. Switch them to PO, then keep them on that drug, depending on what you've chosen for in that five to, seven, five to 14 days, whatever it is. Okay? So that's just general guidance. So it gives you something. It'll change by the time you all get out in two years. It'll there'll be different antibiotics of that. Question? All right. I know that's fast. At least you have heard the antibiotics before. All right. So um, I'll see you tomorrow at eight, and you'll have your prescriptions and stuff, and then you have your test on Monday. All right. And then are you done with GU? Yeah. Wow. Then you go to the ninth month, then you're halfway there. The, no, 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 there's 19, so you're almost halfway there. What is next? Neuro. <laughs> Only because it's McNeil, yeah. It's not just McNeil, it's McNeil's specialty. Yeah, that's true, but he does a good job. He does a good job. He's okay. <laughs> um, since it's got four, there's four topics, yeah. then I will probably do, I'll probably do about six or so per uh, topic. So probably in the 20, probably less than 30, 20, 24, 22, something like that. You're better off with more than less. Oh yeah, yes, that's a good lecture for for him. <laughs> <laughs>